When I was a kid, I used to play in the woods. I lived on what felt like a frontier at the edge of our suburban development. My friends and I, we'd spend hours in those woods, catching frogs, playing hide-and-seek, plotting future adventures. We built these amazing tree forts with multiple levels that reached to the top of the trees. Well, the reality is it <laughs> probably looked more like this. But in my head, it still looked like this. The closest real playground was up at my school. Nothing more than a tall wooden platform, dull metal monkey bars, peeling paint, splinters, and a metal slide that poured kids onto the gritty surface down below. I didn't mind. That's my happy place, my equalizer. See, school wasn't that easy for me. I struggled with ADD, dyslexia, and dysgraphia, none of which was really diagnosed till I was an adult. Pretty sure I spent more time in the hallway with the custodian than I did in the actual classroom. My teachers, they thought that I was lazy, didn't apply myself, and that my head was in the clouds. Not out on that playground. Out there, we were all just kids with the same goal, have fun. Einstein said, play is the highest form of research. There's many scientific studies that show the benefits of play. I mean, that could be a TED Talk in and of itself. But we all know that there's so many wonderful physical, physiological, psychological. I mean, that's where, on the playground, where we learned, really, we learned about rules. We learned, you know, how to interact with each other. Learned how to deal with bullies and acceptance. Plato said, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. In the late 1800s, America is in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. In urban centers, people are living in cramped quarters. 1.7 million kids are working in factories on average of 12 hours a day. The machine age, much like our internet age, is turning the kids into a pasty mush. 1903, New York City opened Seward Park on the Lower East Side. The pent-up need exploded as 20,000 kids rushed to play on their new playground. This really was the beginning of organized and supervised play and leveraged the first serious play movement for children in America. After the crash of 1929, there wasn't a lot of money floating around for things like playgrounds. But the government created a program that built 13,000 playgrounds in virtually every community throughout our country. In the 60s, the space race began. It inspired our nation. We created these amazing places that brought communities together. Families took car trips to go play at these parks. People spent time together. And then in the 80s, the lawyers took over. <laughs> Playground standards and regulations were implemented, and playgrounds became dull and boring. These once iconic playgrounds have been simply removed or fenced off. I mean, come on. You can look at it, but you can't play, kids? See, I've watched this entire paradigm shift right before my eyes. I've literally grown up in the playground industry. My father started selling playgrounds when I was just a little kid. And I, I would spend hours taking apart, putting together these scale models, cutting out pictures from playground catalogs and pasting them together and create what I thought was the ultimate playground. He would take those designs and take them out into the community around the state and sell those same playgrounds. In high school, summertime job, yeah, installing some of those same structures. I continued in the family business, selling these traditional playgrounds, and I loved it. However, the status of play in our country is, has diminished. Research shows that children spend, on average, half the amount of time 
the kids did 20 years ago. Half. Yet they spend on average over six and a half hours in front of some kind of an electronic screen. And of course, the health ramifications of that are, in those past 20 years, childhood obesity has more than doubled. I mean, playground designers are certainly up against some tough competition. Kids have seen it all these days, from the virtual realities on iPad games and apps to the CGI in a Pixar film. Remember Seward Park, where 20,000 kids caused near riots for the right to play? This is what it looks like today. I mean, we've, we've traded the threat of lawsuits for obese children, traded video games for higher health care bills. Parents trying to raise healthy, active children should be rewarded with play environments that inspire kids to pull their head from the digital fog. Several years ago, I uh, had built one of the Midwest's largest inclusive playgrounds. This is a specially designed playground for children with disabilities, wheelchairs, crutches, walkers. It looked not a whole lot different from this one right here. God, I was so proud that day. These two boys rode up on their bikes, and they hopped off and one said, hey, check out that new playground. The other one looked at it and says, yeah, it's for handicapped kids. Let's go. And they took off. I was like, no, that's not the idea. This was to bring all kids together. I turned and looked at that sea of ramps, seemingly going nowhere, with nothing to do, and thought, there's got to be a better way. So back in 05, I thought, I'm young enough to fall flat on my face, and I believe that the world is striving for the same thing I am, which is a more creative approach to play. So with my laptop and cell phone, I started Create Play from really nothing. I assembled a team and set out to change the face of the modern playground. And never looked back. See, at Create Play, we don't just design playgrounds that kids play on, yet we really immerse them into a creative, en creative environment and allow their imaginations to run wild. Now, these are public parks, so they have to be incredibly durable, or what we like to call drunk college kid baseball bat proof. <laughs> we use a reinforced concrete. It's an amazing material. I mean, you can sculpt it, you can mold it, you can manipulate it, you can really create anything, and when it dries, it, it's concrete. And all of our structures still have to meet all of those same stringent regulations and standards that traditional playgrounds do, but with good creative design, anything is possible. Like a 35-foot long slide that has the same height and excitement of, of the playgrounds of years past, without ever having to be more than just a few feet off of the ground. I'd always been a creative person, but because of my dysgraphia, it's a learning disability that affects a person's handwriting and fine motor skills. I can draw, I hardly draw a straight line. But with the aid of a computer and 3D modeling software, I finally found my medium in concrete, steel, and plastic. See, I get to design realistic worlds that delight the senses and, and you know, blow away kids' minds. What about the days of me playing in the woods and climbing on trees? Well, we're combining the adventure and wonder of, of nature along with high-quality, durable play equipment. When El Paso was looking to build a new children's hospital, they challenged us to create an environment that was to be an ordinary waiting room for children and siblings. They wanted something that had a wow factor. Explain to me that many of these children were regulars. They'd been in and out of the hospital much of their lives. Or they were kids that had cancer, coming back to the hospital for yet another round of chemo. They wanted these kids to be able to come there and forget about why they were there and just be kids and play. As children enter this sensory-rich, fully immersive, enchanted space, they're surrounded with 3D textures and realistic surfaces such as hollow logs, theme forest floor, wall murals, 
streams of water, tree forts, and more. Where a 20-minute time period represents 24 hours, where the light changes from the glow of a sunrise and the sound of morning twitter of birds to nighttime, complete with twinkling stars and the sounds of crickets and howls. On opening day, there was a young girl there, wheelchair-bound, deaf, blind, couldn't speak. Her mother came up to me at one point, tears in her eyes. She thanked me, explained to me that her daughter, while interacting with some of the 3D relief animals on the wall, had smiled for the first time in over three years. Township of Upper St. Clair, a suburb of Pittsburgh, they built a Miracle League field. It's an amazing place. It's a specially designed baseball field for children with disabilities that want to experience the joy and benefits that come from playing our national pastime. They wanted these kids to feel as though they were standing at home plate at PNC Park, complete with a view of the city skyline. Highlighted by the Roberto Clemente Bridge, their different towers represent the different classic buildings of downtown Pittsburgh. This baseball-themed environment is wowing kids and adults alike. Inspired by the movie The Sandlot, boards were cut in mismatched patterns and assembled as if children f built this playground with found materials themselves. At the grand opening, there was a father that came in with his child that was disabled. And I had this equal yet opposite experience of my very first inclusive playground I had built years past. He walked in and looked around and went, wow, this is incredible. I would have assumed that a playground connected to the Miracle League would be way more accessible than this. I smiled from ear to ear and thought, nailed it. I went on to give him a tour of the, the, the facility, and his mind was blown that regardless of the, ch the children's ability, they could play and reach up to heights of six feet high. And you couldn't tell simply by looking at it. You know, often I'm asked, what's your favorite playground you've ever built? My answer is usually the same, which is the current one I'm working on. I think that's my ADD. And this had always been true up until we had completed Casey's Clubhouse in Grapevine, Texas. That one was really pretty special. It's a specially designed play environment that was built after Casey, the memory of Casey Tritico, a disabled young girl who had always dreamed of playing side by side with her able-bodied friends. It's a cartoon-themed environment where there's stimulation for all of the senses, except for taste. We're still working on that one. <laughs> but it's such a neat place because it allows children, regardless of their ability, to play along side by side with each other. About three weeks ago, father had called me up and told me that he used to live near Casey's clubhouse, and he used to take his kids there at least three times a week. He said he would go there and the place would be packed. There were kids playing and there were families and people interacting. He shared with me that he had recently moved out of state. And where he moved, he said, it's a beautiful community. There were parks, there were playgrounds. He would go there, but nobody was ever there. He said, nobody was there playing. It felt like a ghost town. He wanted to know, what did it take to build something like a Casey's Clubhouse? He wanted to know what it took to bring community together and play. I mean, play is so important not just physically, emotionally, and mentally. And I have the ability to help kids live a better life. It's pretty awesome. The good news is that the industry is starting to take notice. Playground manufacturers are starting to reawaken the way they think about, design, and build playgrounds. I'll close with an analogy. In the early 80s, Few people had heard of a company called Apple Computer. Few, even fewer imagined that 
computers would be used on a regular basis, or that they could even be objects of high design. Well, obviously, several years later, we all know the rest of the story. Apple went on to revolutionize the way we think about and use computers, and not by simply creating products that simply functioned well from an engineer's perspective. Apple devices are designed to immerse their users into an interactive experience. Now, playgrounds certainly may not revolutionize the world the way that computers have, but it can certainly have a profound impact on our children, and by extension, the world that they will create. And with childhood obesity and attention deficit disorders at epidemic proportions, we need to find new ways to inspire our children towards a more active and healthy lifestyle. We have the technology. We just need the creativity to put it to better use. Thank you.